The main theme today is ethics as a practitioner in the metaphysical arts. And boy, do we have thoughts on this. Let's start the conversation. Hey, mystics. If you're new here, welcome. And if you already know us, welcome back. I'm Susie Parker Goins. I'm Lisa Stewart. I'm Kai Bertrand. Welcome to the Mystic Mosaic Podcast. We're here to clarify, illuminate, normalize, and encourage you as you develop your gifts so that you can confidently build a sustainable lifestyle for you, your family, and even your career. Here comes the disclaimer. We are providing information to you to use as a launching point for your own spiritual journey. We are not giving free readings or medical advice. Information provided here is for educational purposes only. Let's start with ethics. All right, so the first thing we should talk about is just assumptions that are made regarding ethics. Um, The first thing that we wanna talk about is what I refer to as metaphysical babble. Um, Sounds like buzzwords, Kai. Yeah, it is. It's like, it's the thing where, you know, someone asks a question and the answer comes out something like, the reason why you're having such trouble in your life is because you're not aligned with the divine feminine and, you know, your aura is, is, is not, is not clear. It has a, it has a bad color or something, you know, something like that. It's like, for crying out loud, what does that even mean? (laughs) <laughs> that drives me nuts right you know it's like speak english like if you know if i'm asking you when it is now a good time to quit my job like don't be yakking about the fact that i'm not in alignment with the universe like what does that mean <laughs> right so you know that's the kind of stuff where you get into yeah like the the different kinds of buzzwords like the divine feminine and um what are some of the other ones that you guys have come across oh boy anybody who talks astrology to me without me understanding it you know the only thing i know about my sign aries is that i just don't care you know it's like whatever and people are telling me where my moon's at it's like uh, I, I, uh, so that's a question of knowing who you're the person you're sitting with understands other astrologers go off on that but that's, yeah, that's one of the big things for me. Yeah. What about you, I Lisa? A, I have a friend who always, like, she loves to talk astrology. Like, I ask her a question about, like, some planetary shift or something. And she's, she launches into this thing about, you know, the, the moon and blah, 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 and yada, yada. And I'm like, okay, cut the astro babble. That's what I call it. Mm-hmm. And, like, just tell me what it means. Just yeah. give me the grain. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, no, it, exactly. And I think... This happens across the board, no matter what market you're in, you know, coming from the business world, people get caught up in the, well, we can help align your paradigm so that you can achieve greater success. And I'm like, what does that mean to me? Does that mean that um, I'm going to make more money this weekend? Or does that mean that I'm successfully going to get home in time before my dog pees on the rug? What does success mean to me? Right? So yeah, I totally get that. And when I first got into metaphysics and you know, they would say, well, your aura isn't quite clear. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? And they would say, well, you know, I can see your aura. And then I hear other people say, well, yeah, I can see different colors. And for the longest time I was like, so do I have a blue aura? Do I have a pink aura? I don't know what that means. And, and is that detriment to my health? So Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like, and and that's the the thing that comes in where a lot of people will do that. They'll they'll just start rattling off all this terminology, and you know the the poor client is sitting there like a bobblehead, going uh uh-huh, uh huh uh huh, mm-hmm. having no clue what they're saying, no clue what what any of it means, has no point of reference, and then you know at the end of it, it's like, and by the way, that was you know fifty dollars or whatever it is, and the person's paying and feeling like, what did I just pay for? Right, right. They got to learn to ground their language. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, metaphysical yeah. travel just drives me nuts. With the, when I hear people people say that, you know, they even when you ask them, like some spiritual people, like, what do you do? Like, well, you know, I I speak to the spirits. And, you know, to, to gain the wisdom of the ages and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, really? Right. <laughs> right. 
Yeah. And that's, that's, it's frustrating to me too. And, and this is, specifically why I got into helping people in the metaphysical business so that they could learn how to use language that their customers speak and using the voice of their customer to resonate and connect with them. So just as an example, Kai, I would love for you to share with us what you do so that you can give an example of how other um, practitioners in the metaphysical world could actually start connecting with their customers? Well, I always say, you know, I am a Hawaiian kahuna, which is a the Hawaiian version of a shaman. And my specialty is working with energy and specifically um, to remove negative energy from people, places, and things. See, and that's grounded. That's awesome. So you, you've connected what you do with um, how, what you do. So, yeah. Can you also... You said you're a kahuna, but you gave a definition of it in other mm -hmm. language that people can understand. Mm -hmm. So when I say I'm a channel for spirit, I go into saying how it manifests in a variety of ways. And, you know, it's talking to whoever. And I feel that using even, def you can, I don't know if I always use techno, the astro babble, but it's, it's using it in a way that you can explain it because you're helping them develop a shorthand for it. So they can see, oh, a channel is this, but how does this work for me? And it and it brings down the focus a little bit finer, not just to us as practitioners, but to help in the broader thing, the broader view of metaphysics and all the language that includes. Yeah, I mean, like you know, I it's I I'm totally fine with people using terminology as long as you define your terms because right. people yeah. forget that. You know, some of the people that walk through metaphysical fairs, you know, where you're likely to meet somebody, it, they have, like, they walk in the door, they have no clue, never been there, don't know anything about it. And, you know, you're like throwing these, these fancy 25 cent words at them. And they're like, sounds good. Right. What does that mean to me? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, I, I think Kai, what you just said, it, it marries the who you are and what you do perfectly. All right. So the next assumption that we want to talk about is the do no harm thing. Um, that is a particular point because there are some, or in my experience, I've seen some people who have done things that, you know, I, that, that I think to myself, um, no, that's not the right thing to do. Like, why would you do that? And that it would be, um, for instance, someone who says, oh, you know, I need, I need to have my aura cleaned, right? And a healer says, yeah, sure, I could do that. And then after they do the aura cleaning, they go, oh, by the way, you also have a cord. So, but since you don't want to really pay for that, you know, we're done here. And to me, I'm just like, ouch. Yeah. You know, it's like they've, so they've essentially like allowed something to continue because the person didn't pay. And, you know, it's like, there's, there's all kinds of situations like that, where it's just, I'm like, just astounded. Like, uh, why would you do that? It, it sounds like some kind of a la carte, you know, menu. It's yeah. like, I, I didn't know yeah. that was possible. Well, you know, some people will do something like that, but it's like, you know, they don't expectations ahead of time and say well i'm gonna do this but it doesn't include this or you know whatever right um but yeah or the kind of thing where like oh you know you're you're paying for like a seven card reading or something like that and the person's like well i i still have some more questions you're like yeah but your time's up mm -hmm. you know so it's like you can't continue it, it's just it's weird how Sometimes I've seen people do this kind of stuff and, you know, it leaves the customer feeling like bewildered and cheated and, um, yeah. And just not feeling good about the process. I kind of, I feel that as a practitioner, it's, it's our purpose to help them feel, as I put it, complete in the moment. Cause if they have extra questions, yeah. Cause otherwise you're right. It's like, they're, they're kind of floating around the clients floating around, like, um, okay. And then that I think aggravates any anxi anxiety they may feel surrounding. I didn't get it all done. And I, I don't see it as a smart marketing ploy at all. It's leaving somebody floating and, and okay. Yeah. No. And, like and then, 
yeah. And of course that practitioner is not going to get a referral. Right. So you know, you, I've actually seen that happen with like some practitioners that are very, very busy. So it's like, you know, like the ones that have oh. their schedule, like you're scheduled for 15 minutes and that's all you get. And your time is done, which I can understand, you know, but at the same time, it's, yeah, I've seen some other people walk away and just feel like, you know, it, it wasn't enough time and, you know, and I can't, right. you know, and, and, and that leaves people disappointed, which then eventually affects whether or not, you know, I mean, like, yeah, she's really good, but, you know, I don't always get my questions answered. So maybe I'll try somebody else or, you know, spend my money elsewhere. So, yeah. It can affect business. So then yeah. I have a, a follow-up question to that, Kai mm -hmm. and Susie. Um, so you talked about the 15-minute increment. Would it make sense to add padding before and after, or does it make more sense to just create 30-minute segments so that way you have enough time to answer questions? Well, it, it depends because for some yeah. people, 30 minutes can be very expensive. Because there's some energy, there are some psychics and energy healers, they charge a lot of money for their time. And so just even, uh, you know, I know one person, it's like for a 20 minute session, it's like 80 bucks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in that time, you just kind of let her ramble and tell her, you know, whatever comes out and you actually don't ask questions. Because if you do, like she won't finish what she was intending to tell you. And then you don't, you know, then for sure, like you, you know, you feel dissatisfied at the end of that. And then there are other mm -hmm. people who um, they purposely don't pad because they want to pack in as many people as they can. Yeah. Um, and then there are other people who will pad in some time here and there. Um, and they will have either 15 and or 30 minutes, sec you know, so but it's dependent on the healer. It depends on what they do. It depends on how busy they are or how busy they want to be, you know, because that, that whole thing about, we're going to talk about the financial aspect of it. I mean, for some people, this is their livelihood and their objective is to get as many clients as they can within the, the time allowed. Right. So it's not right. necessarily about customer satisfaction. It's more like just get them in, get them out. So that's yeah. too bad. So treating them like cattle, because you, you had said, you know, earlier that, you know, if there isn't enough time for questions or, or practitioners don't leave enough time for questions, I think that it's incumbent upon the practitioner to really understand if you've got 15 minute increments to structure that 15 in, in 15 minutes to include a question or two to help the sitter feel more comfortable in that reading don't you think yeah i mean that's what i do but that's not what everybody does right but that would right um i had it once when i was first starting out i had the times listed out for people to sign up and you know sometimes i i, I would strive to meet that time but then the other people were like yeah whatever and so now it's just like you stop by, you talk. And, and in the course of the conversation, I say, how long do you want to go? Because this is what I charge. And, and I've, I do assure that if someone has added questions before the time is up, I will ask them if they have any more. And, but I, I don't schedule it out because no, I know yeah. I haven't been at events that were that busy right now. So we're still gaining the traction on that. Yeah, no, I've been that this, that was something that I observed at um, an event that has been occurring for several years and they have the same healers come back over and over and yeah, some of them, they have their, you know, they have their sign up lists and um, yeah, I've seen them say, okay, your time's up and off you go pretty much. And, you know, and the next person was already waiting to sit down and so I can understand the need to be organized or whatever, but yeah, at the same time, it's like, it's, so in other words, it's not a perfect system, but no, I, th I think it, right. it's on the healer to kind of make sure that everything or the, the psychic to make sure that everything is, you know, everybody's happy when they get up. And I don't always see that as the case Yeah, because it's bad. like, okay, next let's go. Yep. Here's, here's the, what it's going to cost you, you know, Hand me my money. 
Mm -hmm. and off they go. So that's too bad. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's a question of what the healers or the, the psychic is comfortable doing. And I do believe that that will impact how the clients interact with them. So if they don't feel complete, you're right, Kai, they're not going to come back. And it's like, okay. So I, yeah, it's got to be considered. I, for me, I consider it in the moment. Yeah, no, I always tell people, I ask people up front, like how much time do you want? And mm -hmm. this is going to cost, because I actually have a little thing on my table that says for this amount of time, this is how much it's going to cost you. And then what I normally do if I'm doing a psychic reading with cards is I will actually deal the cards first then I'll start the timer, then I do the reading, yep. and then at the end, there's there's already built in time for, quest, for questions. Oh, that's a good yeah. system. That's you know, a good oh, system. Oh, yeah, the timer is very useful because somebody will say 10 minutes and then, okay, I set it, and then we go from there, but I assure that we have a good close-off at the end, you know, do mm -hmm. you feel complete, do you have questions? And then there's all those questions about, okay, we went over our time, do you need more? Can I wind this up? But see, I'm not at that point where I'm scheduling time so rigidly that I have to to follow up and, and do that. But I, I allow that. I think yeah, that's I near. Okay. I haven't been able to do the, um, or I haven't needed to do like such rigidity with the time or either. Usually I'm, mm -hmm. you know, the universe is pretty good about sending people at the right time kind of deal. Yep. Um, although I have had a couple of people who have kind of sniped at me like, why don't you have a sign up sheet? And I'm like, because whenever I have a sign-up sheet, no one ever uses it. <laughs> yeah. I end up wasting paper. Yeah. Um, are, are, those, are, are those practitioners or are those sitters who are sniping at you? Yeah, they're they're customers because they're just like, you know, I, you know, I wanted a time, but, you know, I don't know what, you know, you didn't have a sign-up sheet. In other words, uh, like, you know, I don't know when you're going to be free kind of thing because they kept coming sure. by and there's somebody already there, right? And I'm just yeah. like, yeah. You know, I just, yeah. whoever sits down, that's who I deal with. That's who the universe sends me. If it's your turn, it's your turn. If not. Interesting. No. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, when I did my first psychic fair in April, May, I just did just a simple two card draw. I called it a mini reading and I felt like it would take 15, 20 minutes. And for me to get my feet wet and to get the vernacular down and the resonance down and you know kind of working with the customers and understanding what that felt like was a really good introduction for me and I felt like you know using using the cards as a tool but I felt going in I knew that I didn't need the cards but I felt like the customers needed the cards because they wanted something tangible to set their eyes on and I felt that, that really helped to create a comfort zone for them. Then we could get into the specifics of, you know, business acumen and what the next right step they should be taking in their business. So that, that yeah. was an interesting process. Yeah. Cards help people to focus on something while they're processing, you know, so it's like they, it's like their eyes visually hold the image of whatever's on the card while their brain is kind of like, okay, so that fits here. What she said fits here. This matches that. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I do a spread, I'm able to tell that story through the spread. And it is that what I call it, the external focal point. So I can point to this and, and that does help to embed it visually into a client so I can see. And also it allows me, while I don't always work with cards, I've had people sit there saying, you don't need the cards. And we would just go off and have our own fine time. But that was resonant with the sitter. Other people want the cards so I can show these correlations in the story that the, st the cards themselves tell. Mm -hmm. They take pictures of it so they can look at it later on. External focal point. It's really useful. It's a tool though. It's not a right. crutch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. definitely yeah and I do the same thing like some I've told people you know there's different ways we can do a psychic reading is like if you just want to fire questions at me and I'll answer them yeah. for you knock yourself out if you want to do the cards we can do the cards and they usually go cards I'm like okay <laughs> <laughs> but you know but I have had one person who was just like yeah I just want to ask you questions I'm like go for it yeah yeah, for 10 minutes, she just asked me questions. I answered and she's like, okay, well, what about this? Or what about that? Or what, you know, da, 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 da. And, you know, 10 minutes was up and she was like, oh my God, that was like one of the best readings I've ever had. I'm like, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, the next topic we want to talk about is for ethics, as far as keeping the channel clean. Um, for me, what that means as an energy healer is making sure that, you know, your energy body, your energy system that you're funneling the energy through is clean. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I do that is, you know, I clean my aura. Um, I make sure that I'm, you know, mentally prepared to do whatever it is I need to do as far as an energy healing session. Um, I have run across healers who they don't actually do any energy maintenance. And for me, I'm like, I do not want you to work on me because I look at that as, you know, the energy that comes from the universe that we channel is clean, pure energy. And it's running through a vessel that's not clean. That would be akin to drinking clean water out of a dirty cup. I would never do that yeah. ever. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think that, that it behooves a person who's very focused on energy, especially if you're an energy sensitive person, before you allow someone to work on you, just kind of get a feel of their energy. Like, does it feel like it's vibrating at a good high speed? Does it feel warm? Does it, you know, does it give you a good feeling? If it doesn't, do not let that person touch you for whatever reason. And you don't even need a reason. It's like, if it doesn't feel good, or if you get an, you know, an instinctive hit that that's like a big fat, no, mm -hmm. just walk away yeah. and just say, yeah. you know, don't, I don't want to work with that person. And like I said, you don't need to give a reason. There's no, no reason necessary. Just say no. Yeah. And you brought up using source energy. I think that's really important that, that people who use their own energy, well, first off, you are talking about having somebody else's energy not being resonant with yours or not being clear. Also, it's a basic Reiki principle that you use source energy to do it because it cleans you out. And then that's what's going out to other folks. Mm -hmm. um, those folks who say, I've, I've heard practitioners said, yeah, I use my energy to do this and that. And I'm like, no, nah. like Kai, I'm like, nope, walk on by. Mm -hmm. I, I, mm -hmm. No. Yeah. You never, you never want to work with someone who uses their own energy for anything just because number one, we're human. Therefore our, our energy by nature is not the cleanest, purest, whatever, at least not compared to, you know, energy from the universe, not right. even close. Right. So if you use your own energy for something, you're actually like, especially if you're using it to help somebody heal, you're actually sending them mm. contaminated energy. Like, mm. Why would you do that? Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. like giving somebody a hug when you got the flu, ew, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 ick. So I have a question then, and that is how often should a practitioner clear um, the area, let's say the table, right? After a reading, how often do you, I mean, do you clear the energy around your table after each reading or do you do it once a day? How, how what's your process for that? Well, for me, if I'm doing psychic readings, I don't worry about that because, you know, like for the most part, like my area stays pretty clean because I, you know, I don't like my, like some people have this thing where they let their, uh, the person that they're reading for touch their cards and stuff like that. I don't, my cards are, have my energy only that I don't, nobody touches my cards. Um, I mean, not to, that I won't show them or whatever, and people can touch individual cards, but it's not a investor energy thing in the cards or anything like that. So as far as readings are concerned, like, I don't worry so much about my table when I do energy healings, that's a different story. Like if I'm at a fair and I'm doing an energy healing, the first thing I do is I put a shield up around the table so that whatever tries to escape cannot. And then I do the healing I clear the energy of everything, including the table, anything under it, whatever, whatever's in within the confines of the shield. Mm -hmm. And then the area is refreshed after that, um, which is another thing that we can talk about, which I've seen other healers, you know, they're because because I can actually see energy. So somebody's doing an energy clearing and, you know, they're another healer is like pulling stuff off of people and it's like they're like dropping it on the floor. And not literally allowing it to like, you know, directing it to go into the earth 
or sending it back to source or, you know, disposing it in some energy responsible way. So it's like, it's literally like, you know, laid on the floor or it's like stuck to the wall or some other thing. And I'm just like, really? Like, is this how you, this is, is your energy hygiene practice? Gross. And, yeah. And it comes from people who cannot, because even though they can sense energy, they don't, I don't think that they realize what they're doing or they're not sensitive enough to pay attention to it. I'm just like, you've just left like an energy blob booby trap on the floor for anybody to walk through and pick up. Ew. I think that's an assumption that newer practitioners or less conscious practitioners use is that it's off, it's good. And it's that cleaning up afterwards that's important or even during. I use a violet flame and I assure the client, I am surprised at how many people who sit with me are relieved to know that I'm not leaving their stuff laying around, mm -hmm. you know, because, yeah. you know, stories that you've told and, and that we've experienced, like, yeah, we don't need to do that. That's not okay. Yeah. You know, and I, and even with like, you know, this is another thing, but like chasing entities away, I've heard somebody say, yeah, you know, I, I, I chased an entity away and I'm like, and where did it go next door like yeah that's my question it's like where is it it needs to go somewhere like not just like you know i was like yeah i can clear out a house and it will move next door and when this when the energy over here is feeling a little funky it will move right back in yeah <laughs> you gotta make it go somewhere. yeah you gotta facilitate the exit <laughs> i was just like yeah astonishing Okay, I think this leads into consent and boundaries. Susie, you want to take this one? Yeah, when you have a person sitting with you and and um, it's important to me to have the consent just because they sat there with me. Frequently people unload their backstory, which is healing unto itself. And I know that's my own business practice and I've got to look at that later. But I do say I, I work with consent because I've had some pretty um disturbing to alarming experiences where people have said uh i guess there's this one woman the first time i was out at one of these events a couple of years ago a woman said i just have to touch you and without waiting for me to say yes or no or give me a minute because i was talking to somebody else she did and she walked away now for me that means i don't trust that practitioner anymore it's really invasive to have someone work on you without your consent that's assault who is dis <laughs> it is psychic assault and i i experienced that just this weekend when somebody said hey blue lady blue lady because i was wearing a blue dress and then as i turned around and i said yes i could feel my plastic smile coming on because he started talking about i hit he got on me and he started sharing it with me didn't ask me for consent and i just kind of smiled at him and said, thank you for the information. Or if there's someone who circumvents consent by saying, your guides told me to tell you this. And I'm standing there looking at them. Uh, why didn't they tell me? They can tell me directly because I talk to them all the time. And later on, when I was in fact talking with my guides, they said she was projecting on me for whatever reason she had. I feel that consent and respecting boundaries is of just it's 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 one of those foundational it's it's one of the very foundation of what it is i do somebody wants to be healed great if somebody doesn't want to be healed it's okay that's their journey it's that separation just because i can do it doesn't mean i should or mm. that i have to <laughs> you know i i have encountered channels who say i'm 24 7 channel and i'm always getting it it's like you know you're making it sound like it's okay to have to be inundated with energy it's like no you get to take a break because again we've got to keep our channels clear we've got to be um at a place where energetically we can handle the things and sometimes we do get to say no and knows a complete sentence there it is so it is. i so so basically ask first yes exactly ask first and then if the answer is no that's okay Maybe they're not ready to go there, or maybe it's not for me to be the one to 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 facilitate it because I don't fix people. We don't fix people. We facilitate the healing. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. experienced once, and and I don't know. I think this kind of blurs the boundary, so maybe 
uh, each of you can kind of help me feel better about the situation where I had somebody in a Zoom meeting. It was like a bunch of us in a Zoom call. And she said, um, hey, Lise, um, your spirit guide wants to talk to you. I'm like, and this was in the very beginning, very beginning stages of me really kind of stepping into spirituality. So was she blurring the boundaries there? What happened there? Well, I, I feel like she was kind of disrespecting boundary. But I mean, I understand this was you starting out, but that could have been an opportunity for her to encourage you to open up to them. Mm hmm. But like just a couple of weekends ago, I had that experience when this woman said her guides, my guides wanted to her to tell me something. So right. she did blur the boundaries a bit by saying your guides want to talk to you. That, that one's kind of, I don't know, it feels, yeah, still because, feels sketchy. Yeah, because then what I intuited was that she wanted me to consult with her so that she could earn money from me. That was what yeah. I was feeling. Yeah, that's, that's probably what it was. I mean, a lot of times healers, again, you know, who are doing the money thing uh, or psychics trying to do the money thing, they are, you know, that's kind of how they bait people. It's, yeah. it's that thing where yeah. if you want to know, you got to pay me. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's a great word. I felt baited. So when people yeah. have said that to me, they're just like, well, if you want to know, and I'm like, nope, no, nope, thanks. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I'm I'm just like, no, I'm I'm not playing this game. Like you don't get access to my wallet just because you think you know something that, you know, even if you do, mm -hmm. even if you actually really did hear something from my guide, I don't have to hear it through you. Right. Like they will find a way to get the message to me. Mm -hmm. If I tell them, like, you need to figure out a way to tell me this without me having to spend any money for it, they will. Yeah. And it's that also that feeling of, I have access to something you don't. It's yeah. like, no, everything's source. Everything's universal. And we all have access. We just find that way that's resonant with us. Yeah. And so to do that teaser, I, no, 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 yeah. no, no. Yeah. yeah I thought that was a lure. That's bait. That's yeah. bait. Yeah. So, yeah. Whew. All right. Good to know. Thank you. <laughs> Let's talk yeah, about boundaries. Having somebody say, yeah boundaries are important but having somebody say um to bait you like that they may potentially also be looking to bind you to them i'm the only one who can fix you and mm. i'm the only one with the information and that's again that's just not okay that's binding you know even if you look at any sort of craft ex um yeah craft practice you have to de determine what's you want to bind to you. So, so tell or, me more about binding. What does that mean to you, Susie? Binding to me. Okay. When I learned it in my, my first level witchcraft class, it's like, if I set out something to, to keep somebody from doing something, you bound them. But because of that intention you're setting up, you are not only binding the person from action, but you're also binding them to you because of that energy exchange, that, that energy attachment so it is an energetic attachment. So I strive to just say, may you get exactly what you deserve and leave it at that. I'm not trying to control their behavior in some way. And, you know, when you have a psychic trying to bait you, they're trying to, to hold them to you in that way where they are the only ones who can fin who can fix you. They mm. like to use the words fix. I refuse. Mm. I don't like that. But that to me is what binding is. It's a form of um, energy and, f and uh, we've got in our notes, energy vampirism, they're sucking my energy to them. And it's like, no, dude, you got to keep your own. And they're not happy with their own energy. They have to go and get somebody else's. And that's not, I don't let that happen. I don't like that to happen. Yeah. But that's what binding is for me. Well, it, Kai, do you have a different the, take? Well, yeah. I mean, I've come across people who have encourage their clients to depend on them like enabling them for every little thing you know the like oh you know should I go see my cousin this week or next week kind of stuff like for every every kind of decision it's like I need to get a reading for this I need to get a reading for that mm. like you know like uh you know should I should I be painting the the living room blue or should it be you know red or whatever that um and it's 
again, another form of that binding because it makes the client feel like they can't make any major decisions unless they get a reading first, which of course gives the, you know, the reader more money uh, and makes them, you know, financially dependent on that person. So it behooves them right. to keep the client coming back for every question. You so know, like you can do that with tarot cards too. What do I need to know for this particular decision? You know, using it to set your intention for the day, that's great, but you're not just tossing down cards. Like, do I turn left at this light or not? You know, and then, you know, <laughs> yeah. what does that mean? It's, yeah. it's, well, I mean, yeah. some people can get to that level and it's just like, you, you don't want that, that, that makes you beholden to something that's a binding of its own kind. And that's why it's like, you know, for boundaries, you know, I always tell people, like, if you have somebody who keeps telling you, well, you know, you, you, you need to come back to me for this. And, you know, that kind of stuff. It's just like, that's who you don't mm -hmm. want. Right. You know, I always tell people like, here's your reading, have a nice day. You know, mm -hmm. we're not, it, that's it. Like we don't, mm -hmm. you know, if there's something else that you want to discuss or whatever, fine. But, you know, here's your complete answer. What you do with that information is up to you. Have a nice day. Um, you know, I don't need to see you next week. You don't, you know, but I've actually heard, you know, like, oh, well, you know, call me next week. And, you know, we'll look at it again. Kind of so, thing. They're, so they're encouraging codependency. Yes. Yeah. And I okay. Like so that. then, so I have clients that are having really intense experiences and I will send a follow-up to see how they're doing. That's different. That's different. Okay, good. I, I wanted that clarification because I don't want to fall into that. No, no, no. The, I mean, I've had category. some clients too where I've done like a major clearing on their house. And I said, you know, if there's something else that pops up, something else that comes up, call me again. And, you know, we'll look at that aspect of it next because sometimes things can be multi-leveled and uh, complicated. So I'm just like, yeah, yeah, let's let's make sure that it's completely taken care of. So yeah, if there's anything else that comes up, then you can call me and then we'll do it again. But again, it's like, I will, I will do things in, in that way, maybe twice, three times. And then I'm like, we're done because I've already had okay. someone like last year, I had a guy who kept calling me, literally, he called me several times a day to clear something from him because he did well, something well, else. Well, and what about this? And what about, I'm like, dude. So finally, like, I just stopped answering, I just stopped answering his phone calls and like ignored yeah. his texts. I'm like, I told him we're done we're done. He's like, but, but I'm like, no, we are done. So if you get to the point where you have a client that's like that, that's super clingy like that, or if you have a, a psychic who wants you to continue to call them for stuff so that you develop a dependence on them, that is not a healthy relationship. That is not a good no. thing. And yeah, run the other way. Yeah. yeah, there are times I've followed up with a client, like I haven't heard from you for a while. Are you okay? And if they answer, great. I don't, I don't badger them. But I also strive to give them those tools that they can do this stuff on their own. That's, yeah. you know what? Sorry, and that's going. the point that I wanted to make with, uh, with you, Susie. And that is enabling the sitter client to regain, reclaim their own sovereignty, their own power right? It's like, I will help you with this. However, then it's on you to do X, Y, and Z, you know? So you're transferring that power back to them and saying, yeah, I can help you, but I'm not going to be all of that for you. you you've got to reclaim that power. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I do the same thing. Like I teach people to do things and I'm just, you know, cause I mean, I had a woman just yesterday. She was like, well, I, you know, I don't know how to do this. It's okay. Well, this is how you do it. Yeah. He was like, uh, I'm like, I'm telling you how to do it because I like, I'm hearing that you are capable of doing this yourself. I mean, you can pay me to do it if you want to, but you can do it yourself. And if you want to learn how to do it, because that's why you came here is you wanted to learn how to do it. That's what you said. So this is how you do it. And she was like, okay. You know, and I was yeah. just I'm like, I want, I want, I'm teaching you to do it. So you could do it yourself. Like, I don't want you to have to depend on me. I said, but if, you know, if, if something goes horribly wrong, then of course, here's my card. You can call me. But for the most part, I feel like you have the skills, you have the knowledge, you have the ability, 
this is how you do it. You focus. This is how you constantly, you know, I walked her through the whole thing. I was like, do you think you can do it? She's like, yeah. I'm like, done. Sounds like she was gobsmacked because you were direct and forthright. (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's the easiest way, you know, it's like, again, I don't do the metaphysical babble. I don't do it. Like I'm a point A to point B kind of girl. It's like, if you want to know how to do it, this is, you do this, 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 and this, and then have a nice day. (laughs) Yeah. That's that's how I work. Yeah. Yeah. To come away with something is really important. I mean, I know I touch base with Kai all the time, but then I feel like, look what I do. You know, it's like the new picture to put up on the fridge. It's like, okay. So I had Kai check in on stuff that I was doing this weekend and it's very empowering. I think a lot of what we do is to help give people that confidence to do this so that we can keep spreading this this healing around. It's not just limited to a select few, and then you have to pay a ton of money for it. I want people to learn how to do this. That's why I, my Zoom meetings, I will video record them if they want, so they can carry that information forward. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's a it's a responsibility that we have as healers and as psychics is that we teach people to do things, to teach people to, you know, to not depend on us. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, I like money as much as the next guy. In fact, you know, everybody needs money. Um, Healers got to pay bills too. Right. But um, I feel like, I don't feel like this is an exclusive club that, you know, you, you must be initiated into and blah, 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 blah. I don't believe in that. I just don't, yeah. I don't get that. Um, yeah. You know, there, there was a lady who I met this weekend who that was her thing. She's like, you know, I want everybody to be able to do Reiki. I'm happy to do attunement and blah, 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 to share it with the world and yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, that's great. But are you actually teaching them what to do with it beyond that? And I, cause I didn't feel like that, that was made I said because it's not just a matter of like you know it's like you you handed somebody like this wonderful thing and didn't tell them what to do with it yeah like, what was the point so I that was right. I'm like I, I just felt like there was a disconnect there and I mean I didn't say that to her but I just I felt like yeah you're missing the other half of that equation mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah. Why, why do I need to learn it? How, what's in it for me, right? Which is the basic fundamentals, what's in it for me yeah. and, and how do I use it? Right. And Lord knows I've talked to both of you on several occasions. I'm like, Oh, that's how I can do this. And Oh, that's how I can do that. And I get that those kinds of teaching come in layers. Um, I know that there are a lot of new practitioners out there who want to learn everything. I want to learn everything. But as I have soon learned, you know, spirits telling me, hey, you know, learn these three things really well, because there's so much invested in those three things that you've got to remember. And if you forget, you're going to you're going to create a snag. And when you create a snag, things are going to break and things break. You got to go back and figure out what you what you missed. So you can't learn all the things all at the same time, as juicy as they might be. <laughs> yeah, well, and, you know, and I've, I've always said to people who are like in training, you know, that who, who consider themselves to be in training, even though we technically all are in training at some point, um, you know, like what you learn, like you build on. So once you understand right. all the basics of stuff, like how yeah. things really work, Mm -hmm. then you can start tweaking things here and there depending on your circumstances. And then you can build, add more things on top of that. But if you don't have a good basis, like ethics, um, you know, like your, everything is built on sand. So you start to do something and you realize it doesn't work or, you know, you're just like, well, how come it doesn't work the way it's supposed to? It's because you're missing some basic component that you never bothered to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And I don't want, I don't know about you two, but I do not want to end up like Luna Lovegood's mother who was experimenting and something went horribly wrong and she died at an early age. (laughs) I do miss her at times. (laughs) Sorry. You know, and the thing is like, you know, we're joking about it, but you know, from a metaphysical perspective, that is absolutely possible. It's absolutely possible. You can destroy yourself utterly with this stuff. If you're not paying attention. Yeah. And, you know, and that's, or, or if you, if you get cocky about it. Oh yeah. 
yeah oh yeah yeah that's <laughs> like that one. we're all like oh yeah oh we don't don't well, get cocky yeah well yeah i mean i've seen some healers and i was like oh that's i don't i don't want to be standing next to you when lightning strikes on that one <laughs> i was like dang like whew, that's that, that was gonna be you're, you're gonna be cooking on that one yeah yeah, yeah. That, what's, that's a, what whew. What what's funny is that as I learn things, I share them with my partner and then I'll go out and I'll talk to him about a couple of things and he'll try to fill in the blanks. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 that's not the way that is not the way that goes. And he's like, oh, I'm like, this is the way it goes. He's like, oh, and I'm like, back off, buddy. I know that you're enthusiastic and I know that you're supportive, <laughs> but no, <laughs> don't go that's that route. That's what I appreciate about this is that we are providing this but we're not sounding like we are at the top of the mountain no you know any i, I just oh. yeah or somebody who can tell you that they are the only one who can fix you i don't know how many you have said i can you have bad energy and i'm like yeah i got my protections thanks yeah yeah and or or you have a curse and i can fix it for five hundred dollars Oh my God, I have seen so many people in different forms going, somebody told me that I have a curse and they could erase it for $500. Do you think that they're, do you think I have a curse? And I'm like, oh, sweetie, <laughs> you know? So it's, and we're all like, no, it's a scam. It's a scam. It's a scam. So no matter if somebody approaches you on the street or in a forum, and those are the words that come out of their mouth, say, thank you. I have it handled. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, the thing is that if you, if you have a curse, like having actually broken curses, like if you have a curse, you will know no yeah. one will be telling you this yeah. because you'll be like, after a while, you'd be like, what the hell is going on? And then you will actually ask someone, hey, am I cursed? And then it will be a person that you will actually trust the answer from. So if it's somebody that you don't really know that says, oh, you got a curse on you, then, you know, you'd be like, uh, thanks. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nothing else, you know, or just whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... I've heard people who like, just, I mean, not just $500. I mean, I worked with one, with one lady who said like, um, she's like, yeah, this guy said he could remove the curse for us for two grand. I was like, yeah what yeah i'm like yeah. uh yeah i mean you know for what i do like when i remove curses it's expensive like mm -hmm. i will say that you know it's not like the run of the mill thing because it's not a run of a mill thing i don't do it every day no but you're but, credible <laughs> but it's not no 500 mm -hmm. you know like i just don't i don't see you know charging that much money and again that comes from that financial need right I mean, like I said, it's not that I don't need the money, but it's like, I, and you know, and we talked about the vow of poverty kind of stuff that, you know, healers struggle with earlier. Um, you know, I don't feel right charging that much money for stuff. I just don't, you know, my, some of my friends give me a hard time about it. They're just like, for what the hell you do. And for like, you know, the effort that you put into it and the amount of power that you put into things, like you should be charging way the hell more and you know, so my prices are going up this coming January. Um, Yay! And, and we're we're going to have a money episode. We are going to have that. I will leave the charge on that. <laughs> but um, yeah, I you know I I have a difficult time like charging for stuff, and and there are times when I know people like so desperately need what I what I can do for them that I. I I sometimes don't even charge them very much because I know they don't have anything, you know, and I know mm -hmm. it gives some people like major heartburn when I say that, but it's like, there's some people like they're so desperate. Like they're like, they can, nobody sleeps in the house. Like people are starting to get sick. Like the pets are dying, all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I, I cannot turn them away because they don't have money. I can't yeah, and there's right. Yeah. And, but, but Kai, honestly, there is a way to mitigate all of that, you know, and a sliding scale could take care of that as well. But yeah, again, yeah. we can, we can talk about that on the money episode. Yeah. So yeah, because yeah. saying you're an entrepreneur with the hair flip, I get to call the shots. And so <laughs> see, it just doesn't have the same impact, but the, it, yeah. the intention is there and we'll talk about intention <laughs> later on. Where's your but, fan yeah. Kai? <laughs> So you can be the, you know, the uh, kahuna model. <laughs> I'm standing on a volcano. Feel my power. 
but yeah, if, you know, if anybody tells you right off the bat that you have some sort of thing or yeah, I've heard that, oh, you, you know, you have a demon following you and I can remove it for blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, no go. I'd probably, I'd probably say, yeah, my demon looks a lot like you. <laughs> <laughs> and you can go away now. Thing. <laughs> I banish thing. I have power. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, look at the bear. I'm not today, Satan. <laughs> yeah yeah and, and yeah that gets over into boundaries we that's reiterating boundaries and and is it okay to segue into what happened this past weekend yes i think so so a lot of this stuff what i i is in now in this story because kai and i were at an event and the first day out, it was the first time I was ever at this event. And the first day out, there was a person who was sitting up behind me and they were squawking over boundaries, which now that I say that, I was like, oh, yeah, that's going to be the theme for the weekend. But then one of those vendors stood in front of my table and at my my neighbor's table, my friend's table, and started throwing down air sigils. She was using her hands and throwing things down. And I'm looking at her like, what? And Mary was saying how angry she was. And even Sue came by and said, what are you doing? And the woman said, just a little something. And so Kai saw it too. And it was a united effort on our parts to create these boundaries. I would check in with Kai frequently. And it's like, what do you feel? And so we created such shielding around me. And then Daniel Steinmetz was standing across from me. And he gave me the image that we're just... You know, there's a light pole here and that we are that street light of, of 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 abilities over here that I was calling in my own. I was setting this up in a way that my light was shining beyond what they were doing. But I had a really thick mirror wall behind me, sending it back. And then um, we did a lot of work overnight. So when I talked to Kai in the morning, it's like, OK. I cast my dragons around here to protect and clear the area. And she was able to describe to me that they were just kind of standing there. I had two sentinel dragons and they were standing there trying to look unobtrusive, but I could feel the energy and I was grateful. But it was so funny because, you know, I'm kind of one of those go big kind of people. But I did have my blue dragons. Um, Phyllis fixed up my dragon earrings to, to bring more energy and more um, presence, not presence. You could see them. They became more visible. And so while I didn't spend the weekend focusing on it, because I trust that when I had these protections in place, that they were going to stay. And as it turns out, I don't know if you noticed this, Kai, but with all of these protections in place, I felt that they knew that they couldn't get their energy in. But each time I had a client with me, the women got really, really loud. I didn't notice, actually. Okay. I noticed it. I had, yeah, it was just so obnoxious. And Lorelai came up to me later on after, you know, we talked to her about it Saturday night and we said, this is what was going on. And then during the day Sunday, she said, yeah, that vendor's not coming back. Now, I don't know if that includes the woman that was with him or not, but it was like, she resorted to, to high school mean girl tactics. Oh, oh. It and, sounded like and, it was very combative uh, and contentious to start. On the her part. She was very aggressive. Yeah. 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 It was on their part, not our yeah. part. I mean, you yeah. know, me, I like go along. I hope. Oh, we all yeah. Have a no, absolutely. Day and, yeah. And all no, stuff you're very like affable. That. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it was just amazing to me how they were trying to get around it. And then. I was walking back from bringing in the wagon so we could unload and I saw him there and I feel like, oh, my guard was down because I couldn't get my wagon through the door. And then they had risers all along here, just this one little step around the perimeter and I tripped over it and he drew blood and I'm just livid. Kai's looking at me like, I can't believe this is going on. So I learned a lot, uh, so very much about boundaries and intention setting a protection, not using my energy, but trusting source is going to come through and keep it clear. I don't know how they did. I honestly don't care because to I, I feel that this is the last time I tell the story because I'm done giving them energy or giving them focus or validating anything that they did. But it was such 
an incredible weekend in that sort of, I've, I've learned a lot. I don't feel like I, I'm, I don't beat myself up over not knowing this because I needed to learn it. Boy, I tell you, this is the, this is the way for me to keep it firmly etched into my energy and into my practice. That this is what I do every time, but we were all pretty dumbfounded by it. Wow. Sounds like wins and wins, wins and wisdoms weekend. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause usually, I mean, even if you don't necessarily get along with the practitioner that's next to you for whatever reason, like if there's no resonance, there's usually not an aggression about it. Yeah. And they were actually like aggressive about taking the space, about owning the space, like owning the territory. And I was just like, yeah, that's not, that's not kosher. Mm-hmm. because you know yeah. each reader has to have their own energy boundaries so that people mm-hmm. who are walking by can get the resonance of them and be like okay is this the person i need to speak to or not but yeah their energy literally just blanketed everything in that area and i was like um yeah no that's not cool so yeah my part in that was i actually pushed the energy back and then yeah put up that mirrored structure and made sure that it didn't leak out the sides so that it would, you know, because sometimes energy can come around barriers and I didn't, you know, I didn't want to make it go all the way across the, the whole front of the building. I just needed it to be like that. So um, that was my part of it to make sure. And then just to double check to, to make sure that there was nothing of theirs left in the energy of Susie or the other person. Which I asked her to do. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't jump in like the cavalry. I was just like, girl, I need your help on this. So yeah, we, well, we, we consent was involved. Consent us, but... <laughs> yeah, no, because that's what I do. Like, I don't, you know, I when I see stuff happening, I don't, I don't fix it. Why? Because it's not my job. Mm-hmm. The, the Hawaiian word for that is kuleana. It's it means responsibility. Mm-hmm. Like your what your burden to carry is. That's what kuleana is. And so when I see stuff happening, unless somebody asks me to step in to fix things, I do not because it's not my kuleana. Like if that if that if I was behind that person instead of Susie oh yeah it'd have been on you know because I'm just like I'm, I'm not putting up with that that's not happening but you know because that that would then become my responsibility and the funny thing is in previous shows I was actually there this was the first show where I was actually across so I was where where you were was where I have been in the the last two shows so we I thought it was kind of weird that I was on the other side this time but apparently the universe wanted you to learn that lesson because if she had done that to me, it would have been a whole different ball game. Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, she complained because she had, she wanted to have room to walk around her table and that would have encroached in my space. And I was very firmly set in my chair. Yeah. She was going to have to move. And I heard her gritching about that. It's like, so you're trying to encroach on boundaries. So, and I know this is probably improbable with the way these fairs are set up. I come from a different marketplace, the the art fair marketplace where we all had tents, right? So we had our boundaries in place. Sure, there was some scuffle about, you know, ooh, somebody moved a, a mannequin a little too far over into somebody else's space that easily got remedied. Um, I've had my my share of issues with, you know, side vendors as well, but it almost seems like if there is another way to address that so that way there isn't such as much aggression in the future going forward. But I know that it just doesn't seem like there's any way that, you know, those fairs could be set up like that. Well, I mean, no, there were, there were you know, vendors that had a pop-up and it was very clearly defined, mm-hmm. but, um, Oh, what was the word you we, said? The aggression around it. Oh, golly. Go ahead and talk, Kai, because I brain cramped. Okay. What, was so, it inside or outside? It was inside. And like all the spaces were clearly marked with tape. So you could see what was yours and what was not yours. And so, I mean, and like I said, most vendors are pretty good about, well, yeah, you can scoot over here a little bit, you know, if you need just a little bit more room. or You know, most, most people are willing to be flexible mm-hmm. about things. I mean, you know, some people will take up every every available inch that is theirs and that's fine too you know as long as it's not impeding other people it's it's all good right as long as we have room to move we're fine um but yeah no this person was actively aggressive i mean like she's literally like claiming territory all the way out to the aisle the main i mean they were they were actually there was they were between three aisles 
So there's one aisle here, one aisle here. And then there's this aisle where Susie and the other woman was. And she literally claimed territory all the way out to this aisle too. And I was like, that's not cool. Mm -hmm. You know, because she already- I think Lorelai Lorelai addressed it. She frequently said the fire marshal requires that we have it this far. So I don't know if she had opened up a book and said, oh, I automatically have the power or she was trained or she was just, just, I don't know. I, but yeah, she was just breaking so many of the ethical rules we carry. Yeah, no, it just, it felt to me like she felt like it, like she could do it. I'm going to do it because I can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was just like, okay. No. Yeah. So that's why, you know, when I saw that you're, you know, cause I, I felt the barrier go up that she was creating and I was like, Hmm, interesting. Hmm. You know, and I wondered if you were going to do something about it. Cause I was, I was like, okay. <laughs> no, no. Nope. It took that physical cue of her standing in front of me when I went, I got to talk to Kai. I got to talk to Mary. I got to talk. <laughs> so I knew this was something I did not, I didn't feel empowered. And well, I did feel empowered to deal with it, but I wanted to make sure it was powerful enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's when we yeah. check in with Kai. Yeah. Well, or I mean, I mean, I trusted people. I don't want to make Kai be the only person we check in with, but definitely I trust what Kai has to say, but I did check in around. It's like, okay, this is not okay. So yeah, because she, yeah. Uh, and, and thank you again for all your help. That was, it's in, yeah. it's embedded in my energy now to do that. Yeah. Well, you know, and because she's, you know, she has some shamanistic abilities but again, I think she just, yeah, missed the ethics class on that. Um, so, yeah. 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 So I'm sure she felt the pushback, but it's like, you know what, whatever. And like, she never, she never talked to me the entire time, which is okay. You know, I don't care. We don't need to be friends. I'm good. Um, yeah. But um, yeah. And so I'm sure that she felt some of my energy in that barrier as well. But yeah, once I put it up, it didn't move. Good. I didn't think it would. So thank you. You know, because I mean, I would have felt the pushback because I was I was checking just to see if it moved any, you know, to see if she tried to hit it or change it or whatever. Yeah. So sometimes I wonder if those actions are ego driven. They are. They absolutely are. Because, um, you know, the thing that people forget is that we are people. Yeah. And even though, you know, we're supposed to be spiritually developed you know we can still be petty as hell <laughs> over stuff we you know we can still be territorial we can still yeah. you know be jealous we can still be envious we can you know we can still have all that stuff right we can because we're human um and so we have the foibles of that kind of stuff and it's the you know i mean i have my moments when i when i'm immature and i like you know like I will play with people like when people come by and they start, you know, dinking around with me and I'm just like, you know, like I, I will actually, well, the funny, here's a thing about this weekend. Um, Mary was telling me, she came out to me after the show on Sunday and she's like, you know, I have, I have really enjoyed sitting across from you because I enjoy watching your face. I'm like, what do you mean? And she said, you know, people come by and if you don't want to have anything to do with them, it shows on your face. <laughs> And I said, yeah, I've never, I've never been good at, yeah, no. Yeah. You want to figure out how I'm doing? Just look at my face. Cause I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like never been good at it. And so, you know, because I can, you know, because I can tell, right. People walk up to the table and I'm just like, keep walking. There's like, there's nothing for you here. Just keep like, don't even stop. Like, this is not your place. Keep going. Right. And she's, yeah. And she's like, yep, yeah, I saw it on your face every time. I said, yeah, I'm not, I'm not good at that because I don't, number one, I don't like to waste people's time and I don't like people to waste my time yeah. because you know, when they come up to the table, you're just like, nope. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like regardless of how much money I might need, I have, there's nothing for you here. Like your yep. person, whoever that is, is somebody else in this room, but it's not me. Yep. Not worth it. 
yeah so I'm just like you know walk on because you know I'm not I'm not about to take your money and not give you anything for it and that speaks to the value is that I want to you know the best readings I have are the people who resonate with me like I had a lady yesterday who like I didn't even see her walk by and she like zoomed in on my table and she just sat down and she's like I I have to get a reading from you and I said okay and uh, you know and I just I (laughs) and it was it was you know for her she was like yeah your reading was like like amazing like it hit all the points that I needed to know and I didn't even know what it was about because I said, you know, don't tell me anything. I prefer if you not tell me anything and then I'll do the reading and then you tell me if it actually means anything to you. And she goes, oh yeah, you hit all the points that we were looking at. And then I did like a, a little mini thing after that because we still had time. I said, okay, what else, do, what else do they need to know? And I threw five more cards and they're, they're just like, oh my God, like one of them was almost in tears because of, of that. And, um, you know, so that's, is it a good thing or a bad thing, Kai? <laughs> good thing. Because like, okay. you get something that's like one of those parts. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, you had that resonance and I'm teasing. You know, yes. for years, I have not had tissues at my table. And then somebody was like, you need to start having tissues at your table. I'm like, no, <laughs> no, I'm not having tissues. Now I have to freaking have tissues at my table because they never bring somebody cries. Every time I'm like, why? What is this? I'm like, you know, somebody sits down and I like I start doing the reading and you hear this. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like tissue. <laughs> you know, it's not about my ego when I have somebody cry. I was doing the the Sunday healing circle and somebody started crying, and guess inside I'm going. Yes, but it's also about them finding that place where we've hit on something and they can release it. Yeah. So it is resonant. Kai mentioned it resonant. So it's Mm -hmm. not about my ego much, but (laughs) it is about (laughs) helping the client because ultimately that's why we're there. Yeah. Well, part of it is like, you're like, I did good, you know, kind of thing. But but at the same time, it's like, yeah. So, yeah. So now I'm like, forever in a day now I have tissues at my table I'm like dang it <laughs> I never needed them yeah. you know all of a sudden I'm like <laughs> before I'm like oh tissue <laughs> and we're not making fun of the sitter by any stretch of the imagination no, no, no. but you know it's because it's- of the fact that I'm not you know because I'm so direct about things most people are like okay got it I got it I got it I got it sounds good yep that's next on my list you know and then you know, and they, but, you know, and it's, but it seems like more often than not, especially when I'm doing readings, when I don't know what the reading is about, like if it's a, just a general reading and I'm just reading the story that the cards are telling and just relaying what I hear while I'm looking at the cards, like almost inevitably there's, there's going to be at least one person who starts tearing up or starts crying or something. I mean, I've I even had a couple of people who were like, they're making me cry. I'm like, okay, you got to go now. You're making me cry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't have this. I will not be stopping at my own table. Get out of here. <laughs> There's no crying at the fair. <laughs> it's just like, oh no, we're done here. You're making me cry now. Wouldn't that would be an interesting intro? I made four people cry in my intro last year, you know, and just turn it into this competition between who's a more powerful practitioner. Yeah, uh-uh, I, I upped that to 10 people yesterday because, oh, yikes. I, those are the practitioners that. I, I understand that we are there to speak our truth and to say, this is what we can do. But when we try to, I don't feel, I know it's an interesting concept to apply to me, but I don't feel like I need to elevate myself over somebody else or monopolize people. I've been at events where somebody was a gatekeeper for it and tried so hard. I could see these claws coming out of her energy saying she needed to have these people stop at her table Okay. I wasn't quite sure where you're going with that, Susie. I was kind of hoping that maybe you could clarify because I, I'm like, I'm so it's that competition that, that let's get more money. And it's that desperation people feel. And I know manifestation and the financial part of it, that's the whole other part of it, but it is a, uh, a practitioner who thinks they are better or they are the only ones to see it. that relates back to binding, but it also is, you know, there's, there's, 
energy enough for everybody to share in and one person's energy is not any better than another. It just is. And so when I, I don't plop out all of these certificates I have, it's like, this is what I do. Mm -hmm. And I find for me, I don't know if that's part of the ethics, but that works for me is to say, this is what I do. And just because I may have some title or I, I don't use any titles, but some people I see really do define themselves by their titles. No, I don't do that. But you're you're a kahuna, Kai. And so, yeah, you you have the right to use that title. And may, is that shorthand then when you get to say that? Because while I use shamanistic practices, I don't call myself a shaman because there are some things that I've not done, like get a training. There was somebody there who was saying she had these trainings and she did all this and she even got it down to a geographical place. And I'm like, uh, I listen to my guides. Yeah. Well, like in, in her case, I know who you're talking about. It's like, yeah, there's a, there's a specific tradition that she got trained in and that she follows, you know, as a shamanic practitioner, you have the ability to gather a little of this, a little of that, you know, that kind of thing. Like for me, um, I am a Hawaiian kahuna because I have my abilities all stem from, you know, my heritage, my skills come from just all kinds of training that I've had. You know, I've trained with different kinds of shamans. I have different kinds of tools. Some are based in Native American myth. Other things are like almost, you know, like Celtic or something. They're all different, mm -hmm. but the basis of my power, the access, the, the power that I access comes from my ancestors and comes from the energy of Hawaii. Therefore, I am a Hawaiian kahuna. And that is that is my tradition. You know, so I actually will ask for help from the Hawaiian gods. I will ask for help from the Hawaiian demigods. I will ask for help from the land of Hawaii and from the sea around it. Um, you know, specifically from the Pacific Ocean. I went to because I'm in Washington State, I went to Ocean Shores a few weeks ago, and I actually got to touch the Pacific Ocean again, which I haven't done in years because I haven't been anywhere near the beach. And it was kind of weird because I kind of like, I sent the energy like a request while I was standing on the beach and the water was rushing over my feet, like to like feel the energy of Hawaii coming through the water. And I actually like, I felt this rush of energy come at me. And, you know, to me, that's like an acknowledgement that even though I don't live in Hawaii anymore, that the land and the sea still remembers me, still helps me. So, wow. yeah. So that was pretty that's damn cool. awesome. So wow. that's why, you know, and cool. because of the fact that I can do all the things that traditional kahuna can do, like I can speak to the spirits, I can, I can settle spirits, I can, you know, have them cross over and, and all that kind of stuff. That's all, you know, I can go looking for souls if they get lost. You know, that's all traditional shamanistic kahuna stuff. You know, I was basically given permission by, by another kahuna in Hawaii who said, like, you're already doing everything a kahuna does. Just call yourself a kahuna. I was like, okay. 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 <laughs> so, See, I don't think I would step that far into it. I Just to actually claim the title because... I don't know. I don't, nobody's given me permission, but yeah, it's interesting that a lot of things I've done intuitively, they still help. And that's the point for me is making it for, to help whoever is sitting with me, the client or customer or whatever, to make sure they're getting what they need in the moment. Yeah. And you know, the other thing is that if you, you know, if someone comes to you with something that's shamanistic in nature, like they won't pick you if you couldn't do it. You know what I mean? Because the universe yeah. always drives you to the correct person that can help you for whatever. So people who come to me for specific things come to me because I'm the one that can do it. Other people, you know, and if there's, you know, other people who can do other things and they go to them instead. So it just depends, um, which is why like this whole thing about, you know, what I call it, a, it basically a pissing contest between practitioners is that, yeah. you know, people think that, oh, you know, well, I'm better than you are, blah, blah, blah. I said, yeah, but that's not in the customer's best interest because they right. need to find the person that can help them with whatever it is they need. So even though like you and I can do a lot of the same things, 
they might resonate more with me than with you right. and vice versa. So mm -hmm. it's really, there is no contest because it right. depends on the customer and what they're ready for. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, for me, like if someone comes to me for shamanistic stuff, that means their shit is serious and they need to like, you know, we need to go into the other world. We need to talk to their ancestors. We might need to do some banishing. I mean, there's like some serious stuff that happens when I, when I break out the shamanism stuff. These are some of the things we've experienced and the ethics that we follow. But we do want you to be aware for your own psychic self-defense. You need to make your own decisions based on your observations. Thank you, Susie. Our discussion today that includes intention and ethics is just the beginning. There's so much to cover and we are excited to cover these at length in our next podcast. Meanwhile, consider taking Kai's course on shielding. You can find that at handsonfire.buzz. Consider heading to information on ethics and consider picking out my 2023 digital calendar that includes moon phase planning at cocreatemagic.com. If you'd like to show us this episode, head to mysticmosaic.com. Okay, you've been watching the Mystic Mosaic podcast. Hit the like button if you found the episode helpful and don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell to be notified when we upload another video. Next week, we'll be talking about toxic spirituality. Join the conversation and tell us in the comment section what you liked about the episode. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover, let us know. And don't forget that we have resources in the comments as well for books that you might want to be interested in reading. Thanks for watching. So until next time, stay grounded, shielded, and magical.